Hey there, and welcome to part four of our series on how to get more out of Bible study. I am Bishop A. Reginald Littman, your host, and I'm excited to share this amazing study with you. I want you to be sure that you do subscribe to my channel. Make sure you hit that bell notification. That way, every time new content is loaded, you'll be among the first to receive it. Today, we're going to be talking about motives for Bible study. And again, this is part four. I am not an airline pilot. However, I am experienced enough after having ridden on a number of planes to know that when it comes to getting an airplane off of the ground and slip safely into the air, approach is everything. In other words, if a pilot is not careful to take his time, use his skill, stay within the lines, go at the right speed and communicate with headquarters, there is no way on earth that that plane can safely get up in the air and off of the ground. And so the same is true when it comes to Bible study, that in order to really get off of the ground, to learn what it is that the Bible is saying to them to whom it was written, from the author who wrote it, to us today, we must approach it the right way. You see, approach is everything. Well, how do you have the right approach when it comes to Bible study? I want to share with you today that it all begins with your motive. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is it that you want to do? Making sure that you're not studying the Bible just to be braggadocious, to be able to say, I've gone through the Bible seven times or every year I read through the Bible in a braggadocious fashion. That is a horrible motive for Bible study. So what are good motives for Bible study? I'm glad you asked. That's exactly what this particular session is all about. So let me give you a few principles that will help you to develop the right motive as it relates to studying the Bible. Here's point number one. Study to be more pleasing to God. Study to be more pleasing to God. Remember that airplane just a moment ago? You saw it just when I just made that transition. You saw that airplane again. Keep that airplane in mind throughout this entire session. You see, pleasing God is kind of like communicating with the tower when the pilot is trying to figure out exactly what it is that he is to do in order to get clearance to land and for takeoff, the pilot has to be in constant communication with the tower. The same is true when it comes to studying the word of God, that in order for us to get clearance from God, who is the tower, we must pay attention to him, follow his instructions and pleasing God is a requirement If you really want to be in the will of God, but why is that true? Well, the Bible teaches us that our passion for studying God's word is directly connected to making God happy. Let me show that to you in the scripture. Second Timothy chapter two, verse number 15 reads like this work hard. So God can say to you, well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed when God examines your work. Know what his word says and means. Now, that's a powerful passage of scripture. It is filled with instruction as to what should be our communication with God, the tower, as we pilot the plane of our life with the Lord truly being the captain of our plane. So we are to work hard that is study in the King James Version so that God can tell us well done. You see, presenting ourselves before the Lord and pleasing God is something that we all want to do as Christians, or at least we should. And one of the ways that we can please God is by knowing the word of God, studying it. That is to say, disciplining ourselves to please God in our ways, according to the manufacturer's manual, which is the Bible itself. Number two, study to grow spiritually mature. 
we should all study the Bible. And one of the major motives should be to grow spiritually mature. Now, listen to this. You can be old and not mature. And you can be young and be very mature. And just like it is that way in life, it is also that way, spiritually speaking, that you can be in church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and still not spiritually mature. And the contrawise is true that you can be a Christian of two or three or five years or 10 years and be far more spiritually mature than someone who has been in church forever. You see, maturity is not about how long you've been around. It's about how much you have achieved in your search and pursuit of God while you have been around. And so maturity is a necessity as a believer. And studying the word of God assures us spiritual maturity if we eat and apply God's principles to our lives. The Bible says to us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 in the Living Bible, Now that you realize how kind the Lord has been to you, put away all evil, deception, envy, and fraud. Long to grow up into the fullness of your salvation. Cry for this as a baby cries for his milk. Of course, you've seen babies long for milk. Everyone has seen that. Everyone has seen a hungry child. And it doesn't matter to that child what time of day it is. It doesn't matter to them what you have on your agenda. It could be three in the morning. If that child is hungry, the whole neighborhood will know it. Because he has a need that must be met. He needs to be nurtured. He needs to receive that which fills him up on the inside. And the Bible is teaching us that when we indeed long for spiritual maturity, we will put away everything that's immature. You see, those things that are mentioned in this verse that are immature are in the second verse of First Peter chapter 2. Look at it again. Now that you realize how kind the Lord has been to you, here it is, the list of immaturities, put away all evil, deception is immaturity, envy is immaturity, and fraud is maturity. Here's what maturity looks like. Long to grow up in the fullness of your salvation. Cry for this as a baby cries for his milk. So the writer there is telling us that we have to decide to be mature as believers. And it only comes by studying the word of God. Now, how does the Bible make you a mature believer? Just like you just looked at that passage there in first Peter, we see what to do and what not to do. But being mature goes beyond knowing right and wrong. You see, the true test of maturity is doing right and stopping doing wrong. How are you doing with that? Well, maybe that's something that you need to pray about and ask God to help you to grow up through the application of his word. That's something I pray every single day. Lord, help me to get rid of everything that is not like you. And that's a prayer that you too can pray. And God will help you with that through the power and application of of his word. Here's number three. Study to develop spiritual discernment. Now, what is spiritual discernment? Spiritual discernment is when God shows you truth from error. You see, in this day and time, it is dangerous not to study God's word because there are so many false doctrines, false teachings, false preachers, who are popularized on television networks every single day. But please hear this. Just because a person preaches loud, long, and strong does not mean that their message is not wrong. You need to know God's word for yourself. The only way 
that you will be equipped to recognize wrong teaching is to know right teaching. And so the word of God will give you the spiritual discernment that you need to be able to detect truth from error. In fact, in this series, I've been talking quite a bit about inductive Bible study. It asks questions, who, what, when, why, where, and then how of every chapter of every book. And when you ask those W questions and the H question, you're interrogating that text for what it has to say rather than moving in with a U-Haul of your own thoughts and making it say what you want it to say. And so when you study God's word using the inductive method, using a survey to see what it was about, who was talking, to whom they were speaking to, what were they talking about, how did it apply to them then, what might be the application for me now, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you discover truth of a text. And when you hear falsehood, you will be able to recognize what does not align with an inductive approach. The other thing that you can do to develop discernment as you study the Bible is what I like to practice at our church, and that is verse by verse expository study and preaching. Well, what does that mean? It means that when I deliver a teaching or a message, I'm staying within the confines of those verses. So in other words, not going to Matthew to prove point number one, and then over to John as a sub point to prove what I said in point number one. And then we'll get to point number two, we're in Revelations. And then we jump from Revelations back to Exodus, from Exodus to Philippians. That type of approach makes a person appear to be eloquent and educated in the scriptures. But the reality is that preparation they used to create that message was designed to prove their point rather than to excavate the text and interrogate the text and ask of the Bible, what is it that you are saying? And then make an application based upon a true study of scripture. And so when you hear preaching and teaching that bounces like a basketball from one hoop to the other, from one state to another, from one testament to another, then you might want to question and ask God to really turn on your zeal and discernment to be able to detect if there is truth in this or if indeed the person who is presenting this is trying to appear to be truthful. Now let's go to the next one. Number four, study to build your confidence in the scriptures. Study to build your confidence in the scriptures. Now, when we study the Bible, our goal is never to be impressive. It is never to make people pat us on the back. It is never to get accolades or at a boys or at a girl in order for people to be impressed by us and to give us praise. No, quite to the contrary. Our purpose for studying the Bible is not to impress people but it is to make an impression on people for God. What am I saying? Simply this, that our goal is not to make people think that we're smart, we're intelligent, we're astute, we're scholars and that kind of thing. It is to ensure that we are capable of sharing God's word with other people. You see, when you have this motive of studying to build up your confidence in the word of God, it doesn't mean that you're looking for a fight or for a challenge, or you're looking for somebody to box with spiritually, or, or you're going to church just to try and check everybody out and 
let them see how intelligent and intellectual you are in the word because you read the word all day long and all night long. That's not what the goal is. However, you want to be able to help those who are not quite as advanced, advanced as you are and to be able to help young, new, struggling Christians or even senior Christians or seasoned Christians, I should say, who may need a bit of clarity on a passage. So our goal is not to be the resident theologian of our church or our small group. Rather, it is to be confident enough to lead someone to Christ. You see, I've seen people argue and debate scripture in threads on the Internet in a Sunday school class. I've seen people challenge a pastor and do all they could to discredit what he was saying. That has happened to me in my early days of pastoral ministry. I had to call my mentor and ask him, was what that person said true? Should I have answered it differently? And that's what I'm talking about, is that we should always seek to be growing and growing and growing to the point that we are capable of mentoring someone else in the scripture. And back then, when I was very young, 25 years old, pastoring my first church, and I got challenged and called on the carpet about something I said, and I had to call my pastor. And here I am now, almost 49, and I'm a, I'm a pastor of pastors. And I have pastors who call me and say, was that right? Should I have answered it differently? So it's a growth thing. And you want to grow in the word and grow in your knowledge. By the way, you never, ever attain supremacy in the word of God. It's a constant growing in his word. We never grow up fully. We are always growing in his word. And so studying the word of God, number four is an excellent, an excellent motive for you to have in studying the word of God. Study to build your confidence in the scripture, not only to help others with the scriptures, but also to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that your salvation is secure with God and be able to turn to passages that can verify not what you said, but what God said. And to be able to share the blessed hope of redemption with other people. You see, it's one thing for you to argue a Bible passage in a thread or online or in an email or even in a Sunday school class or even to challenge a pastor. None of that is important. You know what's really important when it comes to this fourth motive for studying the word of God? Can you lead someone to Christ for the first time in their lives? That's what's important. Do you have the basic essentials to know what it is that you believe and then be able to take that person before the Lord and give them scripture like Romans chapter number 10 and to be able to lead them down the Roman road to be able to confess Christ? That's what really matters most about Bible study is that you're able to share heaven with someone else and not keep it all to yourself. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this little teaching. There is so much more that I can share with you. And if you are interested in more study, I'd love to share more study with you. You can simply go and check me out at clear studies, Gmail clearstudies at gmail.com. Again, that's clearstudies at gmail.com. I'd be glad to share a much more detailed handout of this teaching with you. And I have other resources that are available that you'll see in the material. Getting ready to start a study on the book of James, launching it next week. So if you'd like more, simply email me, clearstudies at gmail.com. God bless you. And remember this, 1 Peter 3 and 15, quietly trust yourself to Christ, your Lord. And if anybody asks why you believe as you do, be ready to tell them and do it in a gentle and respectful way. Well, God bless you, my friend. That's what it's all about. Don't forget, right now, we're in 30 days of prayer every day on Facebook Live. You can find me under my name. And I look forward to sharing with you. 
visit my website and be sure to check out my podcast, blogs, books, and materials that will help you on your spiritual journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. And don't forget, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell notification, and comment. I want to communicate with you in the comments. If you've got a question, drop it in the comments. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Have a marvelous day, and we'll talk to you soon.